When did you first fall in love with robotics? <laughs> Let's start with love and robots. Well, love is, is relevant because I think the, the fascination, the deep fascination is really about movement. And uh, I was visiting MIT looking for a place to get a PhD and I wanted to do some laboratory work. And uh, one of my professors at, in the aero department said, go see this guy, Mark Rabert, down in the basement of the AI lab. And so I walked down there and saw him. He showed me his robots. And he showed me this robot doing a somersault. And I just immediately went, whoa, you know? Yeah. Robots can do that. And because of my own interest in, in gymnastics, there was like this immediate connection. And, um, you know, I was interested in, I was in a, Aero astro degree because you know flight and movement was all so fascinating to me, and then it turned out that you know robotics had this big challenge. How do you how do you balance? Uh, how do you how do you build a legged robot that can really get around? And that just that was a fascination, and it still exists today. You are still working on perfecting motion in robots. What about the elegance and the beauty of the movement itself? Is is there something? maybe grounded in your appreciation of uh, movement from your gymnastics days, did you, was there something you just fundamentally appreciated about the elegance and beauty of movement? You know, we had this concept in, in gymnastics of um, letting your body do what it wanted to do. When you get really good at gymnastics, um, part of what you're doing is putting your, your body into a position where the physics and the body's inertia and momentum will kind of push you in the right direction in a very natural and organic way. And the thing that Mark was doing, you know, in the um, basement of that laboratory was trying to figure out how to build machines to take advantage of those ideas. How do you build something so that the physics of the machine just kind of inherently wants to do what it wants to do? And he was building these springy pogo stick type mm -hmm. You know, his first cut at legged locomotion was a pogo stick where it's bouncing and there's a spring mass uh, system that's oscillating, has its own sort of natural frequency there. And sort of figuring out how to augment those natural physics um, with also intent, how do you then control that but not overpower it? It's that coordination that I think creates real potential. We could call it beauty. You know, you could call it, I don't know, synergy. Mm -hmm. uh, that people have different words for it. Uh, but I think that that was inherent uh, from the beginning. That was clear to me that, that that's part of what Mark was trying to do. He asked me to do that uh, in my research work. So, um, you know, that's where it got going. So part of the thing that I think I'm calling elegance and beauty in this case, which was there, even with the pogo stick, is maybe a, the, the efficiency. So letting the body do what it wants to do, trying to discover the efficient movement. It's definitely more efficient. It also... Um, becomes easier to control in its own way because the, the physics are solving some of the problem itself. It's not like you have to do all this calculation and overpower the physics. The physics naturally, inherently want to do the right thing. Uh, there can even be, you know, uh, feedback mechanisms, stabilizing mechanisms that occur simply by virtue of the physics of the body. And it's, you know, not all not all in the computer or not even all in your mind as a person. <laughs> and I, there's something interesting in that, that uh, melding. You were with Mark for many, many, many years, but you were there in this kind of legendary space uh, of uh, Leg Lab and MIT in the, in, in the basement. All great things happen in the basement. Is there some <laughs> memories, uh, is there some memories from that time that you have? Because it's so, it's such cutting edge work. In, in, in robotics and in artificial intelligence? The memories, the distinctive lessons, I would say, I, I learned in that, in that time period and, um, and that I think Mark was a great teacher of, was uh, it's okay to pursue your interests, your curiosity, do something because you love it. Um, you'll do it a lot better if you love it. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is a, a lasting lesson that I think uh, we apply at the company still, um, and really is a core value. So the interesting thing is I got to, um, uh, with people like Ross Tedrick and, um, and others, like the students that work at those robotics labs are like some of the happiest people I've ever met. I don't know what that is. 
<laughs> I meet a lot of PhD students. A lot of them are kind of broken by the wear and tear <laughs> of the process. Uh, but roboticists are, while they work extremely hard and work long hours, there's a, um, uh, there's a happiness there. The only other group of people I met like that are people that skydive a lot. <laughs> <laughs> like for, for some reason, there's a deep, fulfilling happiness. Maybe from like a long period of struggle to get a thing to work and it works and there's a magic to it. I don't know exactly because it's so fundamentally hands-on and you're bringing a thing to life. I don't know what it is, but they're happy. We see, you know, our, our attrition at the company is really low. People come and they love the pursuit. And I think part of that is that there's perhaps a natural connection to it. It's a little bit easier to connect when you have a robot that's moving around in the world. And part of your goal is to make it move around in the world. You can identify with that. And, and this is on a, this is one of the unique things about the kinds of robots we're building is this physical interaction lets you perhaps identify with it. So I think that is a source of happiness. I don't think it's unique to robotics. I think anybody also who is just pursuing something they love, it's easier to work hard at it and be good at it. And um, it, not everybody gets to find that. Uh, I, I do feel lucky uh, in that way. And I think uh, we're lucky as an organization that, that we've been able to build a business around this and that keeps people engaged. So if it's all right, let's linger on Mark for a little bit longer, Mark Raybert. So he, he's a legend. Uh, he's a legendary engineer and roboticist. What, what have you learned about life, about robotics from Mark through all the many years you've worked with him? I think the most important lesson which was, you know, have the courage of your convictions and, and do what you think is interesting. Um, be willing to try to find big, big problems to go after. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, legged locomotion, um, especially in a dynamic machine, nobody had solved it. And that felt like a multi-decade problem to go after. And so, you know, have the courage to go after that because you're interested. Uh, don't worry if it's going to make money. You know that that's been um, a theme. So that that's really uh, probably the most uh, uh, Im important lesson I think that uh, I got from Mark. How crazy is the effort of doing legged uh, robotics at that time, especially? You know, Mark got some stuff to work, uh, starting from the simple ideas. So, uh, so maybe the other I, I, another important idea that has really become a value of the company is try to simplify a thing to the core essence. And, and while, you know, Mark was showing videos of animals running across the savanna or uh, uh, climbing mountains, what he started with was a pogo stick because he was trying to reduce the problem to something that was manageable and, and, and getting the pogo stick to balance had in it the fundamental problems that if we solved those, you could eventually extrapolate to something that galloped like a horse. And so look for those simplifying principles. Um, how, how tough is the job of simplifying a robot? So I, I'd say in the early days, the, the thing that made Boston, the researchers at Boston Dynamics special, is that we, we worked on under, figuring out what that, that central principle was, mm -hmm. and then building software or machines around that principle. And that was not easy in the early days. and and. It, it took um, real expertise in understanding the dynamics of motion and feedback control principles. How to build, an, you know, with the computers at the time, how to build a feedback control algorithm that was simple enough that it could run in real time at 1,000 hertz and actually get that machine to work. Um, and that was n not something everybody was doing you know, at that time. Now, the world's changing now. And I, I, I think the approaches to controlling robots are going to change, um, but it, uh, and they're going to become more broadly uh, available. Um, but at the time, there weren't many groups who could really sort of work at that principled level uh, with both the software and and make the hardware work. And I'll, and I'll say one other thing about you were sort of talking about what are the special things. The other thing was it's 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 good to break stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, use the robots, uh, break them, repair them. Um, you know, fix and repeat. Uh, 
<laughs> test, fix, and repeat. And that and that's also a core principle that has become part of the company. And it lets you be fearless in your work. Too often, if you are working with a very expensive robot, maybe one that you bought from somebody else or that you don't know how to fix, then you treat it with kit gloves and you can't actually make progress. You have to be able to break something. And so I think that's uh, been a, a, a principle as well. So just to linger on that psychologically, how do you deal with that? Because I remember I had, uh, uh, I built a RC car with that some, uh, had some custom stuff like compute on it and all that kind of stuff, cameras. And uh, because I w didn't sleep much, the, the code I wrote had an issue where it didn't stop the car and it had, the car got confused and at full speed at like 20, 25 miles an hour slammed into a wall. And I just remember sitting there alone in the deep sadness, um, sort of full of regret, I think, almost anger, um, uh, but also like sadness because you think about, well, these robots, especially for autonomous vehicles, like you, like you should be taking safety very seriously, even in these kinds of things but just no, no good feelings. Um, it made me more afraid probably to do this kind of experiments in the future. Perhaps the right way to have seen that is positively. Like it's, it's too like, It depends if you could have built that car or, or, or just gotten another one, right? That would yeah. have been the approach. Um, I remember um, when I got to grad school, uh, you know, I got some training about uh, operating a lathe and a mill up in the machine shop, and I could start to make my own parts. And I remember breaking some piece of equipment in the lab and then realizing, because I maybe this was a unique part and I couldn't go buy it. And I realized, oh, I can just go make it. That was an enabling feeling. Yeah. Then you're not afraid. Yeah, it might take time. It might take more work than you thought it was going to be required to get this thing done, but you can just go make it. And that's freeing in a way that nothing else is. You mentioned uh, the, the feedback control, the dynamics. Sorry for the romantic question, but is in the early days and even now, is the dynamics probably more appropriate for the early days? Is it more art or science? There's a lot of science around it. And, and trying to develop, you know, scientific principles that let you extrapolate from like one legged machine to another, you know, develop a core set of principles like, like a spring mass bouncing system, and then figure out how to apply that from a one legged machine to a two or a four legged machine. Those principles are really important and, and, and we're definitely a core, a core part of our work. Um, there's also, you know, when we started to pursue humanoid robots, um, there was so much complexity in that machine that, you know, one of the benefits of, of the humanoid form is you have some intuition about how it should look mm -hmm. while it's moving. And that's a little bit of an art, I think. And now it's, or maybe it's just tapping into a knowledge that you have deep in your body and then trying to express that in the machine. But yeah. that's an intuition that's a little bit more on the art side. Uh, maybe it, it predates your knowledge. You know, before you have the knowledge of how to control it, you try to work through the art channel. <laughs> yeah. And humanoids sort of make that available to you. If it had been a different shape, maybe we wouldn't have had the same intuition about it. Yeah, so your knowledge about moving through the world is not made explicit to you. So you just, that's why it's art. You and it to... might, yeah, it might be hard to actually articulate exactly, you know. Yeah. <laughs> there's something about, um, as, and being a competitive uh, athlete, there's something about seeing a movement. You know, a coach, one of the greatest strengths a coach has is being able to see, you know, some little change in what the athlete is doing and then being able to articulate that to the athlete, you know, and then maybe even trying to say, and you should try to feel this. Um, so there's something just in seeing. And again, you, you know, sometimes it's hard to articulate what it is you're seeing, but there's a, just perceiving the motion at, at a rate that is, um, uh, again, sometimes hard to put into words. Yeah, I, I wonder uh, how it is possible to achieve sort of truly elegant movement. You have a movie like Ex Machina, I'm not sure if you've seen it, 
But uh, the main actress in that, who plays the AI robot, I think is a ballerina. I mean, just the natural um, the elegance and the, I don't know, eloquence of movement. It's, it's <laughs> it looks efficient and easy and just, it looks right. It looks, it looks right is sort of the key, yeah. And then you you look at um, especially early robots. I mean, they they they're so cautious in in the way they move um, that it's not it's not the caution that looks wrong. It's it's something about the movement that looks wrong that feels like it's very inefficient, unnecessarily so. And it's hard to put that into words exactly. We think, that, and part of the reason why people are attracted to the machines we build is because the inherent dynamics of movement are are closer to right. Mm -hmm. um, because we we try to use, you know, walking gates or we build a machine around this gate where you're trying to work with the dynamics of the machine instead of to stop them. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the early walking machines, you know, you're essentially, you're really trying hard to not let them fall over. And so you're always stopping the tipping motion, you know? Yeah. And sort of the insight of dynamic stability in a legged machine is to go with it, you know, <laughs> let the tipping happen, you know, let yourself fall, but then catch your, catch yourself with that next foot. And there's something about getting those physics to be expressed in the machine that people interpret as lifelike or, or elegant or just natural looking. And so I think if you get the physics right, it also ends up being more efficient, likely. There's a benefit that it probably ends up being more stable in the long run. You know, it could it could walk stably over a wider uh, a range range of conditions, um, and it's uh, and it's more beautiful and attractive at the same time. 